Please take your Bibles and uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 1 through 11, and my text today is verse 10. The Apostle Paul wrote these words under the infallible guidance of the Holy Spirit. So this is God's infallible word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what things excuse me, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust we are well known in your consciences. So far the reading of God's word. Let us pause now and ask God for his blessing. Your word endures forever, O Lord. Your word says that life is, is meaningless apart from you. And we are powerless to make any change apart from your Holy Spirit. And you promised that your word would not return void, but would accomplish your purpose, your good purpose. And I pray that you would accomplish your good purpose today in our hearts and in our lives. For Jesus' sake I pray. Amen. Well, today I'm going to preach what I call a big picture sermon. So often we forget what is the big picture when it comes to our lives. We make lots of preparations for uh, the future, lots of preparations for retirement, for old age. We're careful to make provision for our children and, and our grandchildren. Uh, but how many of us are making preparations for our death and then for what comes after our death? We're all going to die. And then what? Hebrews 9.27. The Bible says it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Death and judgment is what God calls us to prepare for. That's the big picture of our life. When we die, our body returns to dust. And our spirit, if we are a believer, our spirit goes to be with the Lord. If we're, un if we're an unbeliever, our spirit goes to hell. We just read in our scripture passage, if you look at first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 again, verse 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The next major event is Judgment Day. The next time we will appear publicly in body and soul after death will be Judgment Day. At the heart of the Christian faith is the belief that the Lord Jesus Christ shall come to judge the living and the dead. That's Article 7 of the Apostles' Creed. He shall come to judge the living and the dead, those who are alive at his coming. And then those who are dead but will be raised to appear before him as their judge. This article of the Apostles' Creed comes directly 
from the Bible. Here's one example, 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, the Lord Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead at his appearing. That's what he will do when he, when he appears on the clouds of glory. Article 37 of the Belgian Confession does such an excellent job of, of summarizing and synthesizing many scripture passages uh, related to Judgment Day. And I encourage you to read Article 37 uh, of the Belgian Confession. Today we're going to answer the simple question, what is Judgment Day really going to be like? And how do we prepare ourselves? We'll start in the Old Testament because there's perfect harmony between Old Testament and New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Lord God is often referred to as the judge of all the earth. That's in Genesis 18, 25. Isaiah 30, verse 18, the Bible says the Lord is a God of judgment. Psalm 96, verse 13, even the Old Testament makes reference to judgment day. Even the Old Testament makes reference. It looks all the way ahead to when God will create a new heavens and a new earth. That's in Isaiah 65. Here's Psalm 96, verse 13. He is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Here's what it all comes down to. This is what life is all about. Fear God and keep his commandments. Why? For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. The Bible says that judgment is the act of the whole undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it's an act that's going to be done through the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The God-man. Romans 2.16 says it puts it very simply. God shall judge by Jesus Christ. So how is God going to judge the world? Through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to be the judge. All judgment's been committed to him. Turn with me. I'll show you this. Turn with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. The Jews were angry at Jesus Christ because he had the audacity to heal someone on the Sabbath day. They thought that was wrong. They thought that was a violation of the Sabbath command. John 5, beginning at verse 16, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now. And I have been working. There was no doubt in their minds what he was claiming there. Look at the next verse. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Jesus is equal with God. He's God in the flesh. Now look at verse 22. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. There's only one judgment day, and the judge on that day is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to quote several verses. Matthew 25, verses 31 and 32. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, Jesus is referring to himself as the Son of Man. He did that often. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. That's judgment. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. There have always been only two kinds of people, and on judgment day there will still be only two kinds of people, sheep and goats, believers, unbelievers. Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? What's the urgency? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He's given assurance of this 
by raising him from the dead. That man who will be the judge is the Lord Jesus Christ. By raising Jesus from the dead, God showed that Jesus is the judge of the world. He will judge the living and the dead at his appearing. Acts 10, 42, he was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. 1 Peter 4, verse 5, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Nothing is more certain than that truth. He shall come to judge the living and the dead. Romans 14, if you want to turn there, Romans 14 uh, 10 through 12. I want to show you how the Bible makes it perfectly clear that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, Yahweh in the flesh, and he's the judge. Romans 14, 10 through, 10 through 12, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, look carefully. For it is written, Paul is going to quote Isaiah 45, verse 23. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord. That's Yahweh. There's nothing more certain than the fact that the Lord lives. He's the everlasting one. He's always been there. As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us, each one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Look what the Bible says. First, Paul says we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And then he says that's the fulfillment of Isaiah 45 verse 23. We shall give an account to God. The judgment seat of Christ is the judgment seat of God himself. Jesus is Yahweh God in the flesh. Remember what he told the Jews before Abraham was? I am. And they had no doubt what he was claiming because the next verse says they wanted to stone him. Because he claimed to be equal with God. And now our text for today, if you turn to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear. No one escapes this summons to appear. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Each one of us by ourselves, no one else is going to be standing there with us, by ourselves, the Lord Jesus Christ will look each one of us in the eyes, and we will give an account of everything, whether good or bad. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. Now, the idea here is that we will give an account of everything we have done, and then we will receive recompense that word receive carries the idea of recompense in proportion to our deeds either punishment or reward look at it again that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad and the bible says in many other places that the lord will render judgment according to each person's works this is the basic principle of God's justice. God is a perfectly just God. There is no injustice in him. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, Psalms 62, 11, and 12. To you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. Matthew 16, 27, Jesus says, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with the angels, and then... He will reward each according to his works. Now, let's be clear. We are not saved according to our works. The Bible is very clear. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. 
but we forget to read the next verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're not saved by good works. We're saved for good works. Good works are the fruit of our salvation. Prior to salvation, there is nothing good about our life. So let's be perfectly clear. We're not saved according to our works, but we will be judged according to our works. And if you think about it, Paul is primarily speaking to believers here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Everybody is going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, but Paul is instructing believers about how to get ready, how to prepare, what's it going to be like. Look what he says. We will receive the things done in the body according to, to what we've done, whether good or bad. Now, it can only be said of believers that they do good or bad. Only believers will have good and bad works on judgment day. Unbelievers will have no good works, only bad works. Never forget the basics, the big picture. We all enter this world spiritually dead, the Bible says. Slaves of sin, completely incapable of doing anything good in God's eyes. We're not talking about doing good in each other's eyes. We're talking about doing good in God's eyes. God alone sees the heart. It's not sufficient for one's actions to be right unless one's heart is also good. And, and so this is what the Bible means when it says in Romans 3, 12, there is no one who is good, no, not one. And who do you think is going to be the judge of whether a person's heart is good or not? It's not going to be you or I. God alone is the judge. And what does God say about the human heart? Genesis 8, 21, man's heart is evil from his youth. I mentioned in my prayer about the fact that Augustine and his friends stole pears, not because they liked pears, not because they were hungry, but for the pure pleasure of stealing. And Augustine confessed that as the sin of his heart. Man's heart is evil the Bible says, from his youth. And so the Heidelberg Catechism got it completely right in question and answer eight. But are we so depraved? Is this really how bad we are? Are we so depraved that we are completely incapable of any good and prone to all evil? Is that really true? Yes. Unless we are born again by the Spirit of God. By God's grace, we're born again so that we believe in God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the Holy Spirit living in us, we do good works. Yes, we still sin. So as believers, we do good and bad. That's the struggle. That's the Christian life. But unbelievers will only bring bad works into judgment because they will bring a bad heart into judgment. And as one commentator said, this is bad news for hypocrites who act piously, but inwardly are full of evil. God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. All those things that no one else knows about but you. Every secret thing, whether good or evil. We forget the, the omniscience of God. Whatever there is to know, he knows it. Proverbs 15, verse 3, the Lord speaks on our level so we can understand. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Now, the Lord doesn't have eyes like we do, but he can see everything. This is placed on our level. Psalm 94, uh, verses 8 and 9, you fools, when will you be wise? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? You're going to tell me the one who makes the eye can't see? When we look at Mount Rushmore, a human being who had an eye carved that eye or those eyes. 
Well, who made the eye of the carver? You fools, when will you be wise? Jeremiah 23, verse 24, can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? Matthew 10, 26, Jesus said, there's nothing covered that will not be revealed. There's nothing hidden that will not be known on judgment day. There will be perfect clarity. Matthew 12, 36, Jesus says, I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. What if I had a recording of every word you spoke over the last three days? What if you had a recording of every word I spoke over the last three days? I can't even remember every word I spoke. But the Bible tells me I'm going to give an account of every word I have ever, have ever spoken. Hebrews 4.13, there, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You can't get a bigger picture than that. And on judgment day, unbelievers will be judged according to the severity of their sins. And this is important that we understand this. Not all sins are equal in terms of their severity. There will be different degrees of punishment. Everybody recognizes this fundamental principle of justice that it's, it's far worse to murder someone than it is to steal a candy bar. Everybody recognizes the difference. And therefore the punishment must fit the crime. Well, human justice is simply a reflection of divine justice. Jesus said that some sins are greater than others and therefore will receive a greater punishment. Do you remember when the Jews handed Jesus over to Pontius Pilate? Now, Pontius Pilate found no fault in Jesus. He really wanted to release him, but the Jews said, no, crucify him. And so Jesus told Pilate, the ones who handed me over to you have the greater sin. Therefore, we'll receive the greater punishment. The length of the punishment in hell is the same for every unbeliever. Lengthwise, time-wise, if you will. That's the same for everybody. It's eternal. But the intensity of the punishment is not the same. The intensity of the pain will be greater for some than for others. Now, you and I can laugh about that. There's nothing funny about it. You and I are not in hell right now to see the difference. So we might, we might not think, well, what does it matter? You're in hell. Well, we're not there to see the difference. But those who are there can see the difference, can experience the difference. The evil one himself will suffer the worst torment imaginable, day and night, forever and ever. Let me give you a couple of uh, examples of this principle. First of all, Luke 12 47 and 48, Jesus spoke a parable where he says, that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few there's a difference in the punishment. Many stripes, few stripes. Another example, Luke 20, 46 and 47, Jesus says, beware the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These, will receive greater condemnation. And those in our world today who prey upon innocent women and children, they will receive greater condemnation. As I said, we're not there to see the difference, but those who are there do see and feel the difference. When it comes to believers, Paul clearly says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, that we will give an account of everything we have done, whether good or bad. 
Now here a question naturally arises what it means that God promises not to remember our sins. If God says, I will remember your sins no more, then how can it be that we will give an account of everything we've, we've ever done, whether good or bad? Well, we have to understand something. When, when the Bible says God will not remember our sins, that doesn't mean he will forget about them. God can't forget anything. He knows everything. The Hebrew word remember means to bear in mind with the intent to reward or punish. And so when God says he will not remember our sins, that simply means he will not remember them against us. He will not remember them to punish us for them. He will never condemn us for our sins because Jesus was condemned in our place. Remember, Pilate wanted to release him. He found no fault in him. He was perfectly innocent. That was necessary for the just to take the punishment of the unjust so we could be forgiven and saved from our sins. So all of our sins were paid for. Not one of them will condemn us, but we will still give an account of our forgiven sins, if you want to put it that way. And remember, this is not going to be terrifying for us. We're going to be given, giving an account. Think about it. We're going to be giving an account to our Redeemer, to our Savior, to our shepherd, the one who laid down his life for us. We're going to be giving an account in our glorified bodies, completely free of sin. And those who were dead, those who had already died before Jesus returns, before Judgment Day, they've already enjoyed living in heaven in their spirits. So this is not something that should terrify the believer. But on that day we will give an account and the Lord will judge our works. What kind of quality will our work have? And for the first time we will see how bad our sins truly were and how precious our Savior's blood truly is. Let me give you an example of this. Let me show you this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. On judgment day, the works that pass the, the test, whatever that is going to look like, the, the works that pass the test will result in reward. The works that fail the test will result in loss of reward. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13 through 15. So Paul's talking to believers here. Each one's work will become manifest for the day. Notice judgment day is called the day. The day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is, good or bad. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So notice, the works that pass the test are rewarded, the works that fail the test are burned up. And, and, and it says that the believer will suffer loss. That's not a loss of salvation, because it says he will be saved. So it must be a loss of of reward. And there are scripture passages that speak to this. First of all, Colossians 2 verse 18. Colossians 2 18. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels. Second John 1 verse 8. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. We have this mistaken idea that it doesn't really matter what we do. You know, we're going to be in heaven anyway, so what's the big deal? Well, that's not what the Bible says. Judgment Day is very, very serious. Yes, we're not going to be condemned, but we're going to give an account of everything. The works that survive Judgment Day 
are going to be rewarded. So judgment day for the believer certainly ends on a positive note. Everything we've ever done for the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be rewarded. Not because we deserve to be rewarded, but because our Lord and Savior delights in rewarding us. He loves us. Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. And just as there's going to be different degrees of punishment for the wicked in hell, there's also going to be different degrees of rewards for the righteous in heaven. Jesus talks about this in the parable of the sower. Remember the four soils? Only the fourth soil was good. And so Jesus says there's going to be different degrees of fruitfulness among believers. Not all Christians are equally, equally productive in good works. Mark 4, verse 20, these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. There's a nice, concise description of the believer. You hear the word, you accept it, and you bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60, some 100, different degrees of fruitfulness. This is made even clearer in the parable of the talents in Luke 19, 16 through 19. The one who earned 10 will be made ruler over 10 cities. The one who earned five will be ruler over five cities. So here, the, the degree of the reward is seen in the degree of responsibility. I don't know what that means, that we're going to have authority over this or that. But you can see the, the difference in the reward. Some will have authority over ten cities. Some will have authority over five cities. Matthew Henry puts it very nicely. Every vessel will be full and running over, if you will. But not every vessel will be the same size. Every vessel will be full, but not the same size. And without sin, there's going to be no sadness, no envy, only perfect contentment. And yes, we, we will be thrilled just to be there and to serve the Lord for all of eternity, whatever he wants us to do. But as I said, Judgment Day ends on a positive note. We can't even remember everything we did this past week. And the Lord is going to remember everything we did for him. All the good we did. Even those things we thought were not all that important. Were not all that special. Mark 9, 41. Whoever gives a cup of cold water to drink in my name. Assuredly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. You mean I'm going to be rewarded just for giving somebody a, a cold drink of water? That's what Jesus said. Because they did it for him. He's going to reward every prayer we've ever prayed. If you're like me, you probably think that your prayers really don't amount to much. You just say the same thing over and over again. Is God really listening? Well, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 6. When you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who sees in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Wow. We're going to be rewarded for every prayer we've ever prayed. Now, the practical application should be obvious by now. And that is, everything we do every day matters. I like how R.C. Sproul puts it, right now counts forever. Right now, everything matters. And so we should be preparing for judgment day every day. And Paul tells us how to do this. You might have noticed this if you go back to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, Paul tells us the practical application. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9. Therefore, 
we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. There's the practical application. That's how we prepare for judgment day every day. We seek to please the Lord according to his word. We're never going to please him perfectly, but we don't have to. We belong to him. Remember, we do good and bad. We make it our aim. This is our goal to be pleasing to him. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And the second practical application is in verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade others. Do we live in the reality of judgment day? It's appointed unto men to die once and then after that the judgment. We should be warning people. Remember when the Apostle Paul tried to speak about judgment day to Felix the governor in Acts, I think it's Acts 24, I'm not sure where. Uh, Felix trembled, he said, that's enough, I don't want to hear anymore. And I remember when I was a new Christian, I didn't know a whole lot, but I talked about the return of the Lord, I talked about judgment day, and I was witnessing to this unbeliever, and he said, he just got up, he says, nobody's going to judge me. Well, regardless of the results we get, we have to be faithful to what the Word of God teaches John Calvin says, the fear of the Lord is the knowledge that each of us will one day have to give an account of all his actions before the judgment seat of Christ. And if a person seriously considers that, he cannot help but be moved by fear and shake off all his carelessness. What if the Lord called each one of us to appear today? before his judgment seat. Are we ready? It should be our prayer to be ready. We really should live each day as if our life is being recorded, because it is. I don't know if you've ever done this for fun, but, but pretend your house is bugged. Pretend somebody's listening and watching everything you say and do. Just do that for an hour. <laughs> do it for a day. But think about it. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. Well, my prayer today is that the Lord would truly bring this truth home to our hearts. And we'll make the practical changes we need to make to live each day in light of judgment day. Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, we are speaking to you by faith, not by sight, but one day you will look us in the eyes and we will appear before you. Oh Lord, only you can deliver us from our, our sluggishness. I think of your word which says that when you return, you're, you're going to remove the veil that is upon the nations. Uh, we... We live so much of our lives uh, unaware or refusing to take seriously these truths that we've learned today. So help us. Keep us spiritually sober, spiritually alert, and vigilant each day. May this day be a, a day of, of new beginnings. May you lay such a foundation in our lives today uh, that we will never turn back. In your name and for your glory, amen.